We are FBC Summit, leading everyday people to love Jesus and make Him known. Thank you so much for joining us today. Here's our pastor, Dr. Larry LeBlanc. Romans chapter 6. We'll be in verses 15 through 23 as we study together, as we continue to journey through Romans. Um, many of you at some point in recent history uh, have walked into the modern health club. And when you walk into a health club or you walk into a fitness establishment, normally you are greeted from front to back, almost wall to wall, with treadmills or other forms of cardio devices. Uh, sometimes it's a treadmill, sometimes it's a stair stepper, sometimes it's an elliptical machine, sometimes it's a recumbent bicycle. And as you look at them all, you're overwhelmed at, at how many are sitting in there. Uh, sometimes you walk in at a busy time, they may all be filled or they may all be empty. Um, I personally hate treadmills. Let me say that again because I believe that's somewhere in Scripture. I hate treadmills. Uh, and, and in that, I have learned uh, that, that there's a reason why I hate treadmills. And there may be some of you who just love treadmills. That means something psychologically wrong with you, and that's okay. We'll, we'll work through that today in, in our time together. Um, but but I, I realized the other day, I, I, as I was actually got on one and, and was running and running and running and running, and, and I realized, you know what, I, I'm not getting anywhere with this. I'm just in the same spot I was that I started. And then I got off the treadmill, and as if the treadmill was an animate object, I, I had this thought, you don't care whether I was on you today or not. You don't care how far I just ran. You don't care how fast I just ran. If I had never been here, never shown up, never stepped onto this treadmill, this treadmill has no emotions about this and could care less whether or not I ever stepped onto it or not. And the more I began to thinking about this, you, you guys know how strange I am by now, I began to, to do a little research on treadmills. Um, and did you know that treadmills weren't the invention of the modern-day health club? Treadmills did not come about because people said, hey, people need to be able to get out of the rain, and because people evidently hate being outside now, we're going to invent a way for you to walk and run inside. That wasn't the invention of, a, of fitness gurus. Do you know who invented treadmills? Prisons. Prisons. In Victorian England, they invented treadmills for the sole purpose of putting prisoners on them every day and forcing them to walk on inclines all day so that when they got through, part of their punishment would be to see that they had done nothing productive with their day. And I, I walked out the, the last time and looked at those treadmills, and I looked at these people, and you got some people, you know, there's really three different types of people that are on treadmills, right? I mean, you got the guy who's like the wannabe Olympic athlete, you're just getting after it. And then my personal favorite are the woggers. You know what I mean? When I, you know the woggers, the people I'm talking about? They're not really going fast enough to jog, but it's a little faster than a walk, and it's got this power wiggle kind of thing that's going while they're at it. And then you have these people that you wonder, is the treadmill on? Like, are, are, is it on? But it doesn't matter which category you fall into, every one of them are not going to get anywhere. When they step off the treadmill, they will be in the exact same place as they were when they began. And there are a lot of people that are listening to me today that when you look at your spiritual life, some of us feel like oftentimes that we are on a treadmill that we're going through the motions, that Sunday to Sunday, Bible reading to Bible reading, that we are just over and over and over again with the same thing, but we're not getting anywhere. But what we just sang is a key to understanding getting off the treadmill of your life and figuring out whose slave you really are. Remembering how it feels to be free, knowing how it feels to be free, not shackled to the sin and slavery of your old self, but being mastered by the person and the work of Christ. So let's discover that together as we stand and give honor to God's Word and read it together. Romans chapter 6, verse 15. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? By no means. 
Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone to obey him as slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey, whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you wholeheartedly obeyed the form of teaching to which you were entrusted. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. I put this in human terms because you're weak in your natural selves. Just as you used to offer the parts of your body in slavery to impurity and to ever-increasing wickedness, so now offer them in slavery to righteousness leading to holiness. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things you are now ashamed of? Those things result in death. But now that you have been set free from sin and become slaves to God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Lord, teach us today to live like a slave for you, Jesus, and not to go back to the jail of our former way of slavery to sin. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Some of you may remember last week as we began our study of Romans 6 that that Paul began on this line talking about sanctification, of becoming more Christ-like, living in ways that lead to holiness. And so in these verses, in verse 11 through the end of the chapter, he continues on that same theme. And we're going to break this up today to to help you get get a grip on this passage in two different ways. And, And the first is that there are really only two masters that anyone can have. Two masters, either sin or God. The two masters that we either are fall slave to are the master of sin or the mastery of God. Now, when we use that term, obviously it comes with a lot of connotations when, when we say the word slavery and trying to get our minds around that. But understand contextually that when Paul writes to a Roman audience, over half of the people that Paul was writing to either were currently slaves or had been slaves. So what that means is, is that everyone listening, even if they had not been a slave, they were so intimately aware of the context that when Paul writes this, it makes perfect sense. He understands what it means to be duty-bound to a master, and they all grasp that. And if you had to pick the, the hallmark of slavery, the one thing that would have characterized a slave in relationship to his master, the one word that you would use would be obedience. A slave was required to be obedient to his master. And Paul is simply saying in verses 15 and 16, quite simply, that you are either mastered by sin or you are mastered by Christ. It's one of the two. No one is his own master. Now, seniors, I want to talk to you for for just a moment because as you get ready to embrace college and the life that's ahead of you, there is going to be a lie that's propagated in our culture. It's propagated in our worldview. It's propagated on university settings. And here is the lie. The lie is that you are your own master. In the poem Invictus, we are told that you are the captain of your own ship. And most of us, even Bible-believing, church-going people, when you hear that, because it almost sounds like the very core of what it means to be American, we would amen that. I am the master of my own fate. I am the captain of my own ship. In fact, that poem has been used by many to capture what it is that it should look like, how we should approach life. And I would tell you that that lie is something that you need to be very careful about. Because you are not the master of your own ship and you are not the captain of your own fate. In fact, what we just read scripturally says that you are actually mastered by one of two things. Either sin is the captain of your ship, either sin and death is the captain of your life, or Christ is. But Paul makes it clear that you're in one of two camps. 
that you can either be mastered by one or mastered by the other, but there are no other masters. Now, that'll change your worldview. If we stopped right there and just said, think about that for just a moment, as you understand every human being in the world, as you understand culture, as you understand the people that you interact with and those that you're going to go to school with and professors and the people that you work with, they are either mastered by sin or they are mastered by Christ. There are no other, no two ways about it. And Paul's point is, is that for those that would say, and we addressed this last week, why don't we just keep on sinning all the more so that grace may increase? He's saying that if you've been bought by the blood of Christ, that's not even on the table for you because you can't sin and allow that to be your master when you've already been mastered by Christ. We don't control our own life and we don't control our own destiny. Either sin controls it or Christ controls it. Those who avoid submission to Christ, that the way Paul says it in 16, is that they do not offer up themselves to someone to obey him as a slave. He says, you are slaves to the one whom you obey. So for Paul, when people say that they don't want to give their life to Christ because they're afraid of giving up their freedoms. Have you ever heard that? I'm not ready to do that yet. I mean, I'm a college freshman. I've got people to meet and things to do and a life to live. I don't want to be mastered by Christ right now because right now I want to do what I want to do. And there may be a, a time later on in my life when I got old as dirt, like when I'm like 41. There may be a time where I'd be willing to be mastered by Christ. But right now, I want to run this show. I want to captain this ship. And the problem with that is that when people say they want to have their own freedom, the issue becomes that you actually have no freedom. The people that you know that say that they are living free are actually the ones who are illustrating that they have been taken captive by sin and death. Because there really is no freedom. If I'm serving one of two masters then I've even given up my freedom to one or I've given up my freedom to the other. Now, if you're living your life for you and you're living your life for pleasure and you're living your life for enjoyment and you, you're living your life for other people and you're living your life for sinful relationships and you're living your life to be in a sexual relationship with a man or a woman, if you're living your life in addiction, it is because not because you are free to make those choices, it's because you've chosen to let sin master you. And for Paul, he's saying what makes no sense about this is some of you are under the yoke of Christ, but you want to live like you're under the yoke of sin. And so Paul begins to press this point, the same point that Jesus made in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. No one can serve two masters. There is no middle ground. There is a lot of debate in modern politics about citizenship right now. Paul's point is simply this. There's no such thing as dual citizenship. You cannot be a citizen of the country of sin and a citizen of the country of Christ. And so he continues to press that point in verses 17 and 18 because he, he erupts in thanksgiving. But thanks be to God that you used to be a slave. You wholeheartedly obeyed the form of teaching to which you were entrusted you have been set free and have become slaves to righteousness. What is the teaching to which you have been entrusted? What is that? If you had to define that, put a colon there, define it. What is the teaching? It's one word. What is the teaching to which you have been entrusted, seniors? I'm confident as I shook your hand that you do not leave this church with excuse. There are people that go to college with some form of an excuse. But as I shook every one of your hands and handed you a Bible, I will rest my head well on my pillow tonight because I know what each of you have been entrusted with. And what you have been entrusted with is the gospel. And because you've been entrusted with the gospel, it renders you now without excuse for how you know that God's call is placed on you to live your life. Now, Paul's point is not that obedience produces salvation. It doesn't. But obedience is an inevitable characteristic of being saved. Salvation is by God's power alone, but it does not work apart from man's 
will. When it says you have been set free from sin and you have become slaves to righteousness, it wasn't that you were somehow captured against your will. There are no unwilling children in the family of God. There were no forced adoptions. There are no unwilling citizens in the kingdom of God. You chose to place Christ as your master. And someone listening to this may say, why would anyone want anyone to be their master? Because where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. It is for freedom, Paul says, that Christ has set you free. So if you want to know what true freedom is, then be mastered by someone whose love for you and redeeming power is so great that you want to obey him because where sin wants to kill you, Christ wants to give you life and give it to you more abundantly. Now, when we say that, that doesn't mean that he wants you to go to college and get every wish that you ever imagined and marry the hottest girl or the hottest boy or make the most money. It means that, that God's plans for you is that he wants to live, you to live a life of abundance because you live it free from sin, free from unrighteousness, free from wickedness, because you're not free to live how you want to. You're free to live how God wants you to. Do you see the difference? We've told people in church that you're saved, so you're free to live how you want. What a lie from the pit of hell. You have been saved to something, not just from something. What were you saved from? Every one of you, don't be able to leave this church. Don't go to Kentucky. Don't go to Southwest. Don't go to Ole Miss. Don't go to Mississippi State without being able to answer this question. What have you been saved from? This is the gospel You've been saved from sin, you've been saved from death, and you've been saved from hell. That's what you've been saved from. But you ought to also be able to answer the question, what have I been saved to? I've been saved to a newness of life. I've been saved to righteousness. I've been saved to freedom. So what you have been saved to is far, far more incredible than what mastered you before. The slavery we have is not forced against our will but that our will is now enslaved to Christ. It's why Jesus in John 15 said very clearly, I no longer call you slaves, I call you friends. But wait a minute, didn't I just say that you are going to be a slave to Christ? But Jesus said he doesn't call us slaves, he calls us friends. It's because we aren't taken against our will. It's because once we've given our will to Christ, we understand that our entire will is in slavery to Christ now because it becomes our desire to do what Christ wants for us. I preached a wedding yesterday. And in preaching that wedding, we used Ephesians 5 and talked about a wife submitting to her husband. Now, people hate that verse in our culture. They hate it. And this isn't about marriage, but let me explain something to you. And by the way, ladies and gentlemen, if you're looking for a man or a woman one day to marry over the next years at college, then listen to this well. A wife submitting to their husband should not give you any pause if, if the husband is willing to do what Ephesians 5 says and love his wife as Christ loved the church and be willing to lay down his life for her. I have no problem submitting to someone who loves me like that and who wants that for me. The reason that people are unwilling to submit their lives to the righteousness of Christ is because they don't understand just how much he loves them. I'm willing to submit to Christ because what he has for me is so much better than anything else. His plan, his purpose, his goal, his desire for my life. The slavery we have is not forced against our will but our will becomes enslaved. Some of you today may feel like you're struggling to be set free from some sin in your life. But I want you to let the truth that you have already been set free pierce your mind today. You, Verse 18, you have been set free from sin. Underline that. Remember it. Memorize that. You have been set free from sin. Does that mean that you're never going to sin anymore? No, but it does mean you have the power by Christ through the Spirit to make the decision not to sin anymore. You don't have to live in defeat. You don't have to keep repeating the same sin over and over again. Christ has set you free. So what that means is 
where do we take personal responsibility? Here. If you choose to keep committing the same sin over and over and over again, it's not because you can't have the freedom to, it's because you love it and you choose it. The reason that we continue to sin is because we love sin. If we want to repent, it's because we need to fall more in love with Christ and realize I love him more than I do whatever this cherished sin is in my life. Verse 19. I put this in human terms because you're weak in your natural selves. Just as you used to offer parts of your body in slavery to impurity and ever-increasing wickedness, so now offer them in slavery to righteousness that leads to holiness. Paul is telling them that no one stands still spiritually. No one stands still spiritually. You are either growing in Christ or you are growing in sin. Most of the time when you ask people the question, tell me how you're growing in your relationship with the Lord. If they tell you this, well, you know, I haven't really been growing recently. Well, then what I'm sure of is that you've been growing in sin. Because the Bible says that you're either progressing in your relationship with the Lord or you're progressing in your relationship with the other master, which is sin. So believers who are not growing further in the Lord, you're going to slip into sin. Graduates, that's why I would admonish you and tell you wherever it is that you go to college your bible should be at hand your prayer life should be dominant the friends you make should love jesus be enrolled involved in going to church don't give up your relationship with god to embrace a college lifestyle because who cares if you've been mastered by a four-year bs degree if you're not mastered by the christ who can absolutely set your eternities on fire Continue to follow Christ and listen, listen, listen to the convicting voice of the Holy Spirit. I used to believe in leadership that there were people that just had trouble hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit. I don't believe that anymore. In fact, I believe every one of you graduates and every one of the rest of you listening to me in here, if you're truly redeemed, You hear the voice of God. You hear the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. You hear God's call to be in worship, to renounce sin, to read the word, to pray, to share him, to worship him, to stop doing certain things in your life and to start doing others. You hear him. Spending so much time at the ball field this spring, you, you hear parents that sometimes are also coaches, and you'll hear this phrase over and over again. Listen to me. Listen to me. And they're yelling at the kids, listen to me. Keep your bat up. Follow through on your throw. Listen to me. And then they got irate, and sometimes they're yelling at the umpire. Listen to me. And that phrase over and over and over again. Listen to me. And you know what? I can tell at a ballpark in five minutes the children that have any regard for their parents. When that parent says, listen to me, if there is a defiance and an ignoring of even listening to the voice of the child, I can tell immediately that child does not care what his parent says, is not scared of anything that's going to happen, and refuses to listen. When God says, listen to me, keep saying no and find out what happens. Because there's not a parent in their earthly flesh that doesn't say, listen to me, because they want to tell you something that's important. And y'all are already at the age where you've kind of grown, some of you have grown up to the fact that you actually are old enough now to realize that when you were 13 and 14, that your parents weren't as stupid as you thought they were. Some of you still think they are. You'll grow out of that in the next couple of years. But part of the understanding is coming to the the realization that the reason that God is screaming to your soul, listen to me, listen to me, is because he wants you to be obedient and not to grow deaf to his word as he continually convicts you in his life, in your life. 
Now, some of us are holding back aspects of our life, and we'll say things like, well, I mean, I'm, I'm obedient mostly. M- mostly. What does that mean? It normally means there's something in your life that you're holding back, which really means you're disobedient. And if that's the truth, then you'll never know the fullness of joy in Christ. When Paul uses this term that it is leading, verse 19, leading to holiness, your translation may use the word sanctification. When something is sanctified, it is used for its proper purpose. If a pen is sanctified, it's being used to write with. If if glasses are sanctified, it's because they're being used to help someone to see. Spiritually, it's when we are used for the purpose that God intends us to be used for, according to God's design and purpose. So if you're not being used, sanctified to holiness, then confess your sin, repent, be restored, and stop lingering in this ashamed state as if you're trying to do some form of penance by staying miserable. There are people who are saved who have heard the voice of God and have been convicted, but they're going to stay in this state of misery, this this state where it's almost like I need to perpetually stay in this state of of miserableness and, and, and stay in this state of shame and this state of guilt because they feel like somehow that's the only way that maybe they can earn their way to be back with God. When God forgave you initially, it was to rescue you from the dominion of darkness. If you're saved and convicted of sin, don't delay and wallow in your shame and wallow in your guilt. That's a move of Satan to have you believe that you cannot enjoy freedom even if you've fallen back into making bad decisions and sin. Repent of it immediately and move past it and embrace what God has for you now. Quit carrying the weight of guilt. So I ask you a question. Since your salvation, since the time that you were saved, have you ever experienced a time of repentance? This has been heavy on my heart. Heavy on my heart. Because I believe there are a lot of people in church who will tell you that they are believers, but through the course of their time as a believer, they can't tell you one time where they've actually confessed and repented of their sin. I don't mean that you bowed your head and said, Lord, forgive me for all my sins. I mean that you nailed it. You said, God, here is an area of my life that's unacceptable in your sight. Here is a sin in my life. Lord, I'm bringing my language before you. I'm bringing my gossip before you. I'm bringing this sexual relationship before you. I'm bringing this pornography before you. I'm bringing this addiction before you. And I'm bringing it before you and I'm calling it what it is. And Lord, I'm asking you, I'm confessing it, and I'm asking your forgiveness, and I'm asking your Holy Spirit's help to turn from this because I'm tired of being mastered by this. And Lord, I want to be mastered by you. That's what repentance is. And yet, Far too often, we act like because when we were nine, we made a decision for Christ in Bible school that now you're 49 and you've never had to repent not once in your life. God is crying out to you like a parent and saying, listen to me. Your sin is not worth it. But not only the two masters, sin and God, but there are also two results. And verses 20 through 23 make that very clear. The two results, death and eternal life. Verse 20, when you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. That means that you were powerless to meet righteousness requirements. This is one of the reasons why it's so foolish what we see in modern day evangelical circles. The rise of the seeker-sensitive movement, the rise of the megachurch, the rise of the celebrity pastor has seen a rise in people being told that they just needed to clean up their lives, that they just needed to take some action steps, that they just needed to make some changes or do things a little bit different. You can put makeup on a corpse, but you still have a dead corpse with makeup on it. And trying to preach reformation without repentance, 
trying to preach that somebody should make some changes to their life without changing the one to which they are a slave makes absolutely no sense. It's one of the reasons that we don't embrace moralism here or finding your higher purpose or finding your best life now. It's the reason that that we don't stand before you and tell you that that if you'll just take these action steps that you will feel freer in your life and that if all of the things that come with that, because if you aren't changed from the inside out, the rest of that is lipstick on a pig. It's absolutely worthless to your life. Verse 21, I wish I had more time here this morning. What benefit did you reap at the time from the things that you are now ashamed of? Those things result in death. I wonder how many people that are truly saved are actually ashamed of the things that they were. I was overcome in thinking about that this week. Because I realize when so many people give testimonies, I'm disturbed about the way most testimonies are given. Because there are many people that when they give their testimony, they glory more in what they were than what they are. Let me tell you, say that again. When you give your testimony, do you glory more in what you were or do you glory in what you are? Meaning that you tell the whole testimony, you tell these wild tales about whatever you were and whatever was going on, and you you almost tell them with a sense of nostalgia. And then you say, and then Christ saved me and he set me free, and now I've been promised eternal life. Friends, your story of what God has done for you should be much more grand, much more beautiful, much more fantastic than the things that you should be ashamed of about what you were before you were saved. Paul's point to them is when they look back at their life, there should be some things that they were ashamed of because of who they were. But if you are not ashamed of those things, it may mean that you are still embracing and living in those things, which may be an indicator of the fact that you've never truly given your life to Christ. And then verse 23, one of the most well-known in all of the book of Normans, The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The wages of sin is death. Have you ever heard anyone say, I just can't believe that God would send anyone to hell? That's one of the arguments against Christianity now. Romans 6.23 is my answer to that. For the wages of sin is death. Everyone that goes to hell earned it. That's what a wage is. If you go to hell, it's because you earned hell. You earned hell because you earned the wage that we were due. And the majority will earn hell. I know that because Jesus said that we are on a broad road. But yet eternal life, he says, is a free gift. It's what Jesus called the pearl of great price. He referred to it as the treasure in the field. And friends, what we know is that even whether it's a financial standpoint, whether it's a medical standpoint, that specific ailments need particular antidotes. If your car's engine is not running and you replace the brakes, the car's still not going to run. If you have an infection and you take antacids, you're still going to have an infection. Why? Because you fixed something that wasn't the real problem in your life. And that when we talk about the gospel, the antidote, the medicine is the understanding that what has to be fixed is the eternity of our soul. That we have to absolutely repent of our sin and believe in Christ Jesus. So Jesus isn't calling people to buy fire insurance. He's not looking for people who will clean up their act. He's not looking for people who want to have an extreme makeover in their life. He wants to transform. He wants you to be reborn. He wants you to die to yourself, and he wants you to be a slave to him alone. When we talk about living like a slave for Christ, it means that we understand 
that you have been set free from the law of sin and death. And you have been rescued by the power of a redeemer, a deliverer who loves your soul. Now I want to ask you another question. Have you ever repented in the first place? Are you still dead in your sins? Is sin your master? And are you its slave? Are you on the broad road that leads to destruction? Are you on the narrow path that leads to righteousness? I'm not asking you if you've been to church. I'm not asking you if you've prayed a prayer. I'm not asking you if you've been baptized. I'm not asking you if you've read the Bible. I'm asking you, are you mastered by sin or are you mastered by Christ? If you've never been mastered by Jesus Christ, then the Bible says that this is the hour, that today can be the day of your salvation. For the rest of us, I think this passage calls us to take a hard look at our life and simply answer the question, whose slave are you? You have been bought with a price, the price of the blood of Christ. Live like the redeemed. Live like the delivered.